Now that we've got vSAN installed, I want to start talking about storage policies and how vSAN stores its data. But to get there, we have to talk about objects first. At the end of the day, vSAN is object-based storage. We store objects, which is different from block-based storage and file-based storage. So we have to talk about objects to get to those topics. When I think about vSAN, I like to think of a large open warehouse, a space that gives us a lot of customization options. And one of the things we can store in that warehouse in our vSAN data store is file cabinets. And you're thinking, file cabinets, and stick with me on this one. Uh, this is an analogy that I'll probably use for a few more times, at least through our storage policy videos. But at some point, it will break down when we get to the super technical parts of things. But I like to think of VMs like file cabinets. So we can store all these different types of file cabinets in our warehouse. Each VM has its own unique file cabinet. When we open up that file cabinet, we can have five different types of file folders. And I use the word types very specifically, because when we get to our one of our objects, we'll talk about having multiple different types of this object. When we open up our file cabinet, our first object for vSAN is a namespace object. And our namespace object stores our configuration files for our VMs. So how many CPUs, how much memory, how many NICs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It stores our configuration file for our VM. It also stores our friendly name. What did we call it? Did I call it vCenter? Did I call it database? Did I call it email? What did I call that VM? Lastly, it stores our vmware.log file. This says, when did I power the VM on? When did I power it off? Reset, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all things stored in our namespace, which is our first type of object for vCN. Our second object is a VMDK. This stores our data for our C drive, our D drive, our root partition, if we're using a Linux VM. It stores our data. And the VMDK is where we can have multiple different types of objects. So let's say I create three VMDKs. Well, that's not just one VMDK object. That's three unique VMDK objects. And that's one of the things I love about vSAN is because I've got three different VMDKs now, I can customize the storage policy based on our needs. So let's say, for example, that first VMDK, that's our OS. I want more resiliency in the environment to protect against more failures in the environment. But maybe the second VMDK, maybe that's our application drive, or I want screaming fast performance. If I lose the data, not a big deal because I want that performance. So we can customize it based on our needs. Our third object is a vSwap space. And this took me a little while to get my head wrapped around. But a vSwap space is used for our ESXi host when it starts running out of RAM or when it starts running out of memory. It's a place for it to start paging the disk. So this is different from the Windows page file. This is different from the swap space for Linux VM. This is for the ESXi host to page the disk when it runs out of memory. And for vSAN 6.2 and vSAN 6.6, this used to be thick provisioned. So if we gave our VM 12 gigs of memory, we would create a corresponding 12 gig swap space for ESXi host. And a lot of customers started coming to us and saying, it's taking up all the swap space is taking up all this extra storage in my environment. Is there something I can do about it? And starting with vCN 6.7, we started making it thin provision and grow it as we needed it, which is one of the reasons we talk about reserve space and slack space for our vCN environment in case we need that extra storage space. Our fourth and fifth objects are snapshot related. The fourth one is a snapshot of our VMDK. So let's say we just finished installing the OS, installing an application, or doing some customization. We could take a snapshot of that VMDK in case we needed to roll back in case there was an issue. Our fifth object is a memory snapshot. If we were to roll back that VMDK, how does the OS know what files are open and what processes are running? That's where the memory shot comes into play by capturing the contents of memory. It can then provide it back to our OS. If we don't have it, not a big deal. The VM will just do a reboot and come up nice and fresh. For our snapshots, both VMDK and memory, those are temporary states. Those are temporary snapshots. We recommend 24 to 48 hours, and then once we've verified everything is correct, to go ahead and delete them. With snapshots, we can do a deeper dive if you're interested in the future, but snapshots, they start building on top of each other. And so over time, there's a little bit of performance degradation that does start happening, which is why we recommend them as temporary points in time, not long-term and definitely not backups. So now we've talked about our five different types of objects, our namespace, our VMDK, our swap space, our snapshot, and our memory snapshot. But those are just file folders. We have to have something we can put inside those file folders. And that's where components come into play. Components are the actual data. So in the case of our namespace object, we've got our VMX file that says how many CPUs, how much memory, how many NICs. That's stored in a component 
that's stored in our namespace object. We've got our VMDK object. It's a nice empty object. We store our component inside of that object. And for components, it's not a document. It's not a slideshow. It's not a presentation. It's not a spreadsheet. It's one large storage space that we're storing inside of that object. Now, there are a few caveats that come along with that, and that's not technically how it actually works. But when we talk about storage policies, storage policies dictate how many components we have for each one of those objects and the distribution of those components across our environment. There's also a size component, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. And I think that's a good place to start wrapping up this video because we've talked about our five different types of objects. We talked about how our components are stored inside of those objects, and we've laid the foundation to start talking about our storage policies. I hope you found this video informative. I'd like to thank you for watching.